Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I interview a guest that really has some great ideas and is a huge problem solver. And that is what I want to talk about, problem solving skills and why that is important. For example, persistence. Persistence is an important problem solving skill in my view. I'll bet misunderstood a bit. Now, I'm not talking about repetition, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. I'm talking about determination and perseverance kind of persistence. The fact is, as an entrepreneur, the problems that we face are complex and sometimes even pioneering the problems itself. Being persistent in a way that tries to solve the problem in more ways than one and then trying to find a better solution once the problem has been solved. I have failed to succeed in previous ventures, but I do not consider it failure. I consider it an opportunity to learn so I can be better the next time because I will try again and again and again. But as I mentioned, it cannot be the same solution expecting a different result. It is important to have critical thinking. Honestly, we should have critical thinking in everything we do. My current role in healthcare is to analyze and evaluate the healthcare market. That is the very definition of critical thinking. My job to be successful is to literally be a critical thinker. Critical thinking is not only important when trying to solve a problem, but it's also important when trying to avoid problems, finances, legal issues, employee issues. Critical thinking should be the central success to life and business. Creativity, although not critically important to success, I would say I have interviewed some entrepreneurs who believe they are not creative yet they have been very successful. But then I think creatively in business, I think the lateral thinking, thinking outside the box for ideas. We must constantly ask different questions about the same problem to lead to better solutions. That is why I'm here, to ask questions of everyday entrepreneurs to better organ economy. Now, once you have solved an issue or believe you have, as an entrepreneur, initiative is key to driving success. Everyone has an idea, but only an entrepreneur pursues that idea as a business. That is the difference. I bet right now there are solutions floating around in minds, but with no initiative from the unbeknownst entrepreneur to develop the solution over time. Because let's face it, it is not easy. It takes time. It takes being flexible to constant change. But most importantly, it takes self-discipline. And that is the area where I'm focusing on myself. The ability to push yourself forward, stay motivated, and take action. Wow, what an incredible definition, honestly. And self-discipline expands way beyond business. From healthcare to finance to simply not being an asshole sometimes. Life takes self-discipline. But in business, self-discipline is important because it will help us remain on the right path without being distracted by external factors. It reminds me of athletes when they're in the zone, right? They can't miss a shot or they're shooting every shot perfectly or they're making every play. We've all had that moment, the in the zone moment. Well, self-discipline in business is having that moment all the time. It is the ability to stay controlled and remain focused on finding solutions to problems. In short, self-discipline is the ability to control one's feelings over one's weaknesses. If you want to get somewhere in life and in a business with goals to achieve and dreams to chase, establishing problem-solving skills early is key to success. This podcast was edited by Modern Ally, the business for small businesses and nonprofits who want their graphic design, marketing, social media, video, and other media projects done right. Modern Ally has a passion for supporting community education and social rights. The best part, Modern Ally meets businesses where they're at and works to create custom packages and services that fit your business needs at your budget. Say goodbye to overpriced, unpersonal, and out-of-touch agencies and say hello to your newest ally. To get started, visit yourmodernally.com or you can follow Modern Ally on Facebook or Instagram. Welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. My next guest is a storyteller and creative techie that is 
designer, a former college athlete whose injuries led to discovering visual arts. He is a multi-talented cartoonist, animator, podcaster, AR mobile developer. Please welcome Stephen Christensen, founder of Eltopia Studios and current medical student. Stephen, what's going on, boss? Man, you know, just uh, living life. Living life. Let's, so... I'm ex- very excited about this because this is very interesting. I think it's very novel what you're doing. It's like you have to be like super creative, I feel like, to do something with what you're doing. So let's talk about Iltopia. But first, introduce the world to Stephen. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I'm Steve. I am. I, I, I used to say I'm a jack of all trades, but uh, and then I used to be known as like a generalist in like art terms. It's like you sort of like can't settle in anything you're indecisive uh but right now i am a an interdisciplinary artist i mean immersive artist essentially it's sort of a catch-all for generalist but better term and uh i'm getting ready to start medical school and nice i am uh i own i founded two companies and <laughs> you know it just just i have time on my hands and just I, grinded. And I just do a lot of yeah just grinding i like just it grinding away so well First company. Let's talk about that first before we get into Iltopia. What was the first company? Uh, so interestingly enough, right? Um, when I was playing football, I just wanted to just like have my own cartoon, and so I started this blog uh, called Stuck on an Island, and it was really me. It was an outlet for me to sort of balance the sort of the trials and tribulations of like being living in Hawaii and not having money and being, you know, playing football, but also yeah. being injured and, and all that stuff. It was sort of the intersection of all those things. And so in the vein of like the boondocks and all these like cartoons that I admired, I just started to just like have my own version of it, uh, mm. create, you know, my own little world. And so first started off as stuck on Island that sort of followed me. Um, Interestingly enough, like actually I incorporated Iltopia, which is sort of like a branch of, uh, of one of my web comics. And I just recently actually incorporated a uh, stuck on an Island, like probably a couple months ago. Oh really? Yeah. And so full circle. Yeah. So the project has been the project. I always consider these things projects. I like it. Uh, the project has been around for probably about, yeah, this is like the 10 year anniversary of it. And on the 10 year anniversary, uh, uh, the year uh, that I, yeah, 10 years to the year, um, you know, I decided to incorporate and be like, okay, this is clearly not going anywhere. I like so let it. Let me just, uh, let me just try to make it legit. Just, just pivot on. I, I would say it, it um, the stuff that I do with Iltopia, um, because I do so many things, the, uh, the stuff that I would normally try to fit Iltopia in, mm-hmm. I realized that I'm constantly trying to fit Iltopia in beyond the scope of what it was originally uh, made to be. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, and so instead of trying to uh, make Iltopia work for it, I might as well just start another entity. Yeah. So let's, let's, let's tell the folks at home, what is Iltopia and what does it do? Uh, Iltopia is pretty much a, like a publishing house. It's a publishing company. And, uh, and it's really focused on, uh, publishing comics and cartoons and, um, that focus around black experiences. Uh, and, and that's what I've personally done with it and, and, and built it up into that point and mainly to just fill the void and acts in access points for creators to get their stuff out there. Mm. Um, you know, so I, you know, me as a creator, I create work and then I uh, publish it through Iltopia. Mm-hmm. And it just so happens that I, uh, you know, I'm the founder of Iltopia. Yeah. And so, uh, and so that, that's where Iltopia sort of fits in lines. Gotcha. And, um, and yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it's been a, it's been a very informative journey um, as a business person. That's also a creator. Um, because I have to look at things in a different way to, to get my own work out there that mm, I often yeah. want to think about. And so, you know, one of the things you mentioned earlier is, is the fact that you played football. Let's, let's take a step back a little bit. Cause I want to talk about the struggle a little bit. Cause we were talking a little bit earlier about, you know, how, how you kind of got here. So let's, let's take a step back. Where, where, where'd you from? You went to college. 
what, how did you, how did you find this passion for this? Yeah. So, um, I am from, uh, Northern California. Uh, I've split time between, um, the Bay area, primarily like Richmond, California and, uh, in Sacramento. And so, um, you know, from there, got a football scholarship, uh, well, had a lot of football scholarships, but, um, you know, one of the top guys coming out in, uh, in Northern California, uh, around that time. And I ended up going to the university of Hawaii. And so, uh, and so this was like around the end of like June Jones years and Colt Brennan, Mm -hmm. RIP and, and like all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and so from there, you know, the goal was to just Go to go to college because you had to do that, and then you know from there go to the league, and then yeah. you know figure figure out what figure out the new path in life by the time <laughs> I'm 27 or something like that, yeah. right? And um and when I got there, I uh, you you sort of you you quickly see the how sort of disparities sort of are perpetuated in mm. uh, higher education, uh mm. you know because I was sort of that quintessential you know black male goes to predominantly white school on a football scholarship and the football scholarship sort of dictates your experience, your college experience, Mm. right? Yeah. You get, you know, the, I guess the perks of being an athlete on campus, but you, those perks don't necessarily lend to having agency as a student. And so, uh, you know, I went there wanting to be a math major quickly learning that, uh, you know, the athletic department didn't necessarily want that or the coaches didn't want that. And then the, the professors had, you know, their, their biases towards athletes and, you know, they just made it hell for you. And so, uh, and so, you know, after my first, my first semester, my first year, uh, doing that, you know, I sort of had to make a decision of like, okay, like maybe this pathway isn't, isn't for me and not because I don't have interest in it. Right. And, uh, and, and that, that sort of, you know, being a continuous thing that happened and, uh, and from there, you know, just navigating, getting, getting classes done and, uh, and making relationships and not trying to get in trouble and, and yeah. all these different things. And then also, oh yeah, we're going to be playing on ESPN next week. Like <laughs> let's not get embarrassed. Right. <laughs> and so it, it was, a uh, you know, the, it was exhilarating. Like you, you get to travel, you get to meet people, you never know who's going to be a future Hall of Famer. Yeah. Like all those things are great, especially if you're winning. Um, you know, it comes with those perks, but it really felt like, um, you're like walking on eggshells, mm. right? Like you crash your, you crash your moped into somebody, the back of somebody's, you know, like truck and it causes a dent. And there's a police report that's written about it. And then you find yourself on ESPN because of X, Y, and Z. Yeah. And oh. Like the internet wasn't as bad as it is now. So oh, like, yeah. it, it wouldn't that, be yeah. like Twitter threads, but like, that's how, that's how it was. Like, it'd be like, oh yeah, so-and-so got, you know, caught doing this or so-and-so did this and stuff like that. And so, uh, it, it you know, it was, it was, it, it was what it was, right? Like you sort of had the highs and then you have the, like the highs and the lows. Um, and so the sort of mundane life of like college life was, you know, it, it came and went, mm-hmm. uh, but it, yeah, like everything was just really focused around sort of football and, and being broke and not being able to do anything about it. Right. Like it, it, they always presented it as, you know, this is an investment into your future and the future is you doing well so that the team could win so that you can have a shot at the NFL. And your big payout is if you do well, then you will have a better life in the future, but you got to do all the stuff first. And then eventually you'll, you'll have, you'll be able to celebrate and stuff. So it, it's a, it, it was a lot of that. Um, and for me, I, I, I always had this interest in wanting to, you know, just do more than just like being a football player. Yeah, definitely. I think I think that if I would have focused less on doing other things and focused more on doing, uh, you know, being an athlete or a football player, I probably would have had a better college career. But I also had two hip surgeries. And if I didn't sort of explore other things, I I'm not really sure 
you know, the, the end of my uh, college career would have, would have been as hopeful or right. optimistic. You know, we, we kind of discussed that um, when we were first, you know, before we came on the air kind of, you know, I was like, Oh yeah, well you got, you got college paid for, but you know, one of the things you, you highlighted for me, which I didn't realize. And I think my listeners probably don't realize is like, no, you paid for that with your body. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, interesting thing. I was, I think one of two or three division one college athletes. I think I was the only black one that, um, that was a second year grad student that had honors. And, um, and by that time I had to take out probably twenty thirty thousand dollars $30,000 in uh, student loans to like help me do that. And that's just because there is this, there's this sort of, I wouldn't say it's a, it, it's, it's marketed as, you know, like you get this free ride, right? Mm-hmm. You, you have everything paid for. It's like, no, you actually don't. You only get room and board paid for and you get, uh, and you get, um, like classes paid for. And you can't have a job. Yeah. You can't have a job. Um, they will actually punish you if you do get a job. Um, and that you're making above like a threshold for pretty much like you're like a student athlete is supposed to be below the poverty line by intention, um, mm. for, because a lot of the things are like federally funded and all right, that stuff. Yeah. Right. And so, um, uh, the thing, the thing that they don't tell you is that any incidentals you have to come out of pocket for. And so it's like, you need to pay for deposits for, uh, for like housing. You need to, um, pay for art supplies and studio equipment or whatever for your courses, right? Like all those like incidental fees you have to come out of pocket for. You got to eat. Yeah. You know, like, you know, training table, uh, perfect example, like training table. Uh, when I was in Hawaii, they would give us $108 a month for, for just to live off of outside of everything. Right. And so we would, um, we would have, uh, like, we would have to work out at like three to four. And then we would have like film from like four thirty to like, like six thirty or seven. And then we would have, tra- we would have study hall at like eight from like eight to 10. And so, uh, and so at s- in the dining rooms would, f- would close at nine. Mm-hmm. And so, if you didn't rush to like, yeah. and, and they were kind of stingy with like letting you take out food and stuff like that. And so, um, could you not like every day, like pretty much every day of the week, they, uh, we had to figure out something to do after, after study hall because everybody would be hungry because we didn't have enough time to like go across campus to like eat at the, eat at the cafeteria or bring stuff home or bring stuff with you. Right. So like everybody was just like starving you know, and then you have to make weight and stuff like that. So like everybody mm. was like calling parents, be like, Hey, you know, like we, we need food. Like yeah. it, it's a, you know, it's kid, you know, like it's, I've never been so hungry over a, like chronic hunger Ugh. is, uh, is, uh, that's what comes with being a student athlete, chronic hunger and, and finding ways to, uh, to make ends meet without being, without getting in trouble. Like that, <laughs> that's how, that's how every day was. <laughs> So how did, so you mentioned you wanted to take math class and, and, and that, and you went to grad school. How did, and you're going to med school, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm going Amazing to stuff. Right <laughs> how did, how did this all though kind of translate or where did you find the passion or the time really to do Eltopia? Um, so I had, I had two hip surgeries when I was at Hawaii and when you, and so the second hip surgery, I actually ended up quitting the team. And, uh, and so when I, yeah, the week that I had my second hip surgery, I quit the team. And so I got my release and everything. And so technically I, uh, and I quit the team in the fall. And so, uh, and so I pretty much recovered and had spring, uh, had pretty much had spring semester from like January to like May to just, I was just a student, right? Mm-hmm. It was just sort of a lame duck period. And so, uh, and so I had this idea of like, crap, you know, like I don't know what to do with my time. I don't know what to do with anything because football just sort of took so much yeah. of my life yeah. that like, there was just a big void there. And, uh, and I had the Liberty to sort of just like explore and figure out, figure things out. 
And so I was like, I just want to like create the boondocks. I just want to create a cartoon. I sort of narrowed down, like, what do I really care about? Like, what do I have to offer the world outside of my body? Right. And so I just sort of settled on cartoons. And so, um, you Love know, it. out of all this stuff, right? Like math, <laughs> cartoons, you know, football, baby. This, I'm, I'm make cartoons. And so, uh, and so I remember going to Borders Books back when Borders was still alive. Yes, I right? remember Borders. And uh, and I, I got this book called Web Comics for Teens, and I just sort of like read it, like front and back. Probably the first book that I actually like had the intentions of reading, right? And uh, and I just spent like. A couple of a couple of months just, you know, trying to fine tune, figure out what I was trying to do, realize that making a cartoon or animating is a lot diff lot harder than it is. <laughs> and it, you're not gonna figure that out in a couple of months, especially in twenty eleven. You know, we just weren't there yet. <laughs> right. Like Blender wasn't popping like it is now. Um, but uh I, I just kept I just kept just being diligent and yeah. um and so it allowed me to sort of just take my mind off of things. Mind you, I had hip surgery, so I couldn't I wasn't walking, I Man. wasn't doing anything. I was just sitting at home, uh sitting uh, sitting at home and, and just trying to figure stuff out. And so um yeah, I just kept I just kept just putting ideas to the paper. I am a big boondocks fan, so I kept uh I just looked at his path, right? He started off on he started off making just a, a just a comic strip. He uh, decided to get that in the school paper. And then from there, it started to pick up more. Yeah. And then from there, he just got a cartoon or he had like this, you know, YouTube show and he did all these different things. So I just literally just replicated that. Yeah. And um, and so from there, I just create stuff, put it out online on DeviantArt, on Facebook. And uh, and then people just started to like it. And so then I had the opportunity to, to get on with the school newspaper, you know, then I got the, you know, got used to getting published and then I was like, Oh snap, like that's all you gotta do. Just do stuff and then put it out there. And, uh, and then when I left Hawaii, I got to Oregon state and pretty much just decided to continue that. Mm -hmm. Right. So I got on with their, their school newspaper, uh, kept getting published, um, you know, started doing some more stuff for YouTube, put out some more cartoons. And then, you know, when I, uh, I ended up going to Portland state to, to like for the pre-med stuff. And I just kept doing all that stuff. Right. And then, uh, now I'm like currently in the Willamette weekly. Yeah. I'm doing, I'm yep. stripping the Willamette weekly. And, uh, and that's just sort of what I've learned is, you know, just, you have to have a desire to constantly create stuff and share with people. Yeah. And, um, the life of a creator is that of literally creating for an audience that, um, that you often don't see. And so, uh, and so it just sort of, for me, if, if one person reads it and enjoys it, cool. Totally. If nobody else reads it, but me, cool. At least I get, at least I'm getting published and, and getting published a hundred times is better than, than having an audience to me. Yeah. You know? So what, what, what all the different avenues, you know, for the folks at home that maybe are interested in making, publishing their own work. Other than Facebook, you know, we kind of know the general medians that are available to us, the social yeah. medias, but what other avenues are out there that maybe people don't know about? Um, I mean, it, it's, it's really depending on if you want to go the digital route versus the print route, mm. print route, you really don't have, uh, well, essentially the print route, you can do it all yourself and you will spend time trying to figure out all the stuff you got to figure out doing, right. Getting an ISBN number, uh, getting, you know, building relationships with, uh, you know, different, uh, stores, unless you have a following, then you're essentially just marketing yourself. And then from there, uh, yeah, just, um, you know, you put it out there and you give people a way to buy stuff and then people will buy it. Yep. That's essentially what I found. Right. And, uh, and, and so you kind of have to know how to do that. Or you have to know somebody that knows how to do it, or you find a company that, you know, has an audience already that just has that sort of formula already. Yeah. Well, you are essentially, you're creating value. Yeah. You right? know, it, it's a, it, it's, it's one creating something, then adding a value, like putting a value on it, putting it out into the market to sort of, you know, verify whether that value is what it is. And then, uh, and then you create an access point for people to, uh, to, you know, sort of 
claim that value. Right. Totally. Totally. So let's, let's, let's kind of get into the business part of, of Iltopia a bit. So you started it kind of like in your dorm, it seems like. Yeah, essentially. <laughs> yes. Yes. I, uh, I started in my dorm um, and it was actually the byproduct of, I had no intentions of, I had no intentions of like starting a business. Like, kid you not, I had no intentions of starting a business. Um, but um, one of my mentors, after I, after I did a, a Kickstarter for, uh, for one of my books, because I figured like this was during the time where uh, like independent publishing started picking up as Kickstarter got it, like started mm, getting right. bigger. Right. Yep. And mainly, um, and I was part of that whole like black creator camp that was like actually getting books like funded, but through Kickstarter. Mm. Cause like in the publishing industry, like, you know, black people just don't get published. Yeah. Like it's that, not what you know. It's who you know in the yeah. publishing industry. Like it is just like black people just don't get published. Right. But there's access points. If you know how to navigate them, you know, you could buy a ISBN number for like 150 bucks or whatever, or, or 10 for like 250, And then you find a printer and you, after you find a printer, you essentially just design everything. Everybody uses Adobe InDesign at this point. Yeah. And, uh, and you just send it to them. They print it cut it and then they send it back to you and then you sell, you know, and, uh, and with conventions and stuff, you just, everything is sort of, there's an ecosystem that people sort of found to navigate. And, uh, and so that's pretty much the world that I was operating in. And then, you know, my mentor was like, well, if you know this and it's that hard, then there's clearly an opportunity here. Yeah. Right. To, to do that for other people or to scale or whatever. And, uh, and I was like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, and so, you know, like you just like, let, let's just start a company and, so, yeah. and do that. And so I was like, okay, cool. You know? And, uh, and I didn't know what the heck I was doing. Yeah. yeah. Did you, so your LLC, S Corp, C Corp. Yeah. Yeah. So S Corp, um, so S Corp for Iltopia. And so it's technically it's Iltopia studios. Mm-hmm. And so there's, uh, there's Iltopia, which is sort of the world that I created, Gotcha. And, uh, and that's sort of the intellectual property that like I started. Then gotcha. there's Iltopia Studios, which is the studio that that creates uh, that publishes all of the the creative works of Iltopia. Right. So we think of like Iltopia is like Mickey Mouse and then Iltopia Studios <laughs> is like Disney. Right. Nice. That, that, that's that's pretty much how it is. I like it. So, I like that's um, a great analogy right there. Yeah. And so uh, and so Iltopia without the studios is, is the IP. And then, Ilt- uh, yeah, and then Iltopia Studios is the uh, is the S Corp. And why why did you go with S Corp? Um, like I said, you know, I it was just one of those things that, um, I pitched it. I pitched the idea with my uh, my mentors. Like, mm-hmm. you know, this is something that can really, really, it can get to a point that like has an impact. Yeah, and. Uh, and when I talked to him about just the impact that I wanted to have, not only in uh, for black creators or just, you know, just black people in general, the community. Yeah. Uh, it, I want to address certain things that um, that a corporation would have the have the opportunity to do. Yeah. You know, that, that goes beyond uh, just one person. And so uh, and so from there, just the just the opportunities for expanding the way that I envision it being. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I either sort of like go the grant route and try to, you know, be a nonprofit and sort of yep. go that route. Or I just have a corporation that, you know, will have the agency of an Amazon. Yeah. Right? So. So how did you go about funding? Did you go grassroots efforts? Did you go venture capital? Yeah, just grassroots. Just, you know, at some point I was working like just grinding six, seven jobs. Oof. And uh, and then I got to a point where I didn't have to work six, seven jobs. And <laughs> And now I'm at the point now where I'm like, huh, I could take on this project, but I don't really need to because, yeah. you know, I got money coming in from here and here and here. And I like it. All that. So it, it's a, yeah, you know, funding is, you know, funding, it's a slow burn. Yeah. Uh, it's a slow burn, but um, I, I, the thing that I really enjoy about this is that I have the confidence to, um, I just have the confidence to just be like, okay, I, I want to do this. I'm going to just do it. Yeah. And I know how to, I know I'll just figure out how to, 
how to get it done. You know, being, I think that's important, you know, having the confidence of that, that high risk tolerance. Yeah. Right. How do you create new ideas? How do you generate new ideas? Oh, it's, it's living at this point. Like the, the problem that I have is that if you give me, if you give me enough time and if you give me enough time and problems, I will figure out a solution and a way to scale that solution into something viable. Mm. And, uh, and that's pretty much been the pandemic story for me. Yeah. Right. I kid you not like, <laughs> like March 15th. No, it was March 15th. It was like March 17th. Uh, when people were trying to like find toilet paper and stuff like oh, that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I was, I went to the mini mart and tried to get, uh, when I, whenever I'm stressed, I, I, I have this thing of like eating Ben and Jerry's ice cream. Nice. I, uh, and so I went to the mini mart, Ben and Jerry's ice cream costs what, like a, a pint costs like what? Five ninety nine maybe. Yeah. Like, no, like it's like three forty three or something like that. I need to go where you're shopping. Yeah. Like it, it's <laughs> a, you know, it is, it is a pint, right? Kid you not. Go there, not trying to get toilet paper, just trying to get a pint of ice cream because I was stressed out like everybody else was. Try to run my card. Card gets declined. Try to run my, like my other card. Card gets declined. Ugh. And I'm looking at my bank statement like, dang, or like the online banking thing. I'm like negative $5 in my account. And I'm like, dude, I got, you know, projects didn't come in. Nothing like, like. I don't have any money in my account. I can't get any ice cream. Like that's where I was at. Right. Yeah. I had to dip out of my savings, which only had like 60 bucks in my savings at that point. And, uh, and I was like, dude, like I need to figure something out. Right. right. And, and it was really just like, from that point, it was just grinding. Right. It was just grinding, grinding, grinding. I was like playing around with like some podcast stuff. I was like, Oh, you know, a lot of people were asking me how to start a podcast. Right. So I just made a course. You know, just recorded myself. It was like a like a two, three hour course walking people through like what my process was. I just put that out. You know, people started to tap in with that. Then I was like, oh, snap, I'm learning this other creative things. Yeah, we just record myself doing that. And uh, and so, you know, at first I was just sort of creating cartoons and trying to publish those and then sell those at like markets. And then I was publishing tutorials because. I just, that's what I had yeah. at the moment. And then you know, at some point I was just like, well, I'm going to just be the, you know, the black guy, you know, on YouTube, <laughs> that's like teaching you how to do a podcast and then yeah. do some AR stuff and all these different things. And, uh, and, and that, and that, that's pretty much just how it started. I was just like, I needed to buy some ice cream. So yeah. I needed to, <laughs> like, it's just like, I, you know, man, it, Ben and Jerry's is good. That's yeah. Not, right. Like it, it's your I old just, life. Yeah. Like, and that, and that's just, that's just how it goes yeah. you know, for me. Yeah. It's just responding to the things that just happen. And, you know, you're either going to succumb to the adversity or just those things that, that happen or you, or you find a way to, you know, to come out on top. What what do you feel was like the crux or like the, the, the tipping point when you're like, you know what, this business venture, I, I made the right decision. Um, or are you there? I think that it hit me that I made the right decision when I, I mean, I think the pinnacle of it was really the being featured in the wall street journal. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, let's, let's talk about that. You were featured. You, so you keep on dropping these gems. You keep trying to like to hide them. <laughs> the well, no, it, like it, journal. Let's talk about that one. How like, did that uh, happen? So I did this thing. So during all the craziness of, uh, of, um, like June, 2020, June, July. Yeah. June, 2020, uh, where everything was just like all the protests and everything mm-hmm. people were getting hit in the face and snatched up by the feds and all that stuff. Right. Like, uh, I made this project or I started thinking about like, okay, like people were going on protesting, but it's COVID. Right. Yeah. And then, you know, I'm still applying to, I'm applying to medical school. Like all this stuff was happening. And so I was like, dude, I want to, you know, do the stuff cause I'm black and this affects me and I want to, you know, be a part of it. 
but I can't I can't afford to get a case because <laughs> they they not letting black people in the medical school and they definitely not going to let black people in the medical school if they got much yeah. like it's just not happening like my dad works in law enforcement like my family is deep in like all that stuff I know like I know they're telling me they know like it's not a, it's not like this isn't a game right and so um and so I was like okay this whole thing with like AR, I'm learning it. I'm getting better. I know people, I know this is where things are going. Right. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so I was like, what if I, instead of making a mural or making a statue or anything to sort of, uh, pay tribute or honor or show solidarity, what if I made this sort of AR experience that, um, that allows you to still take the pictures, right? Everybody at this point, like the whole movement started off with pictures and videos right? on Twitter and, yep. and social media. So it's like, why not lean into that, right? Use AR, do all these things, put them in the context, provide context, and then also create the experience and share it, right? So I made this AR experience where you put a 3D model of George Floyd that I found on the internet and all over these hot spots in Portland, right? Mm-hmm. 30 foot monument, it would take, you know, you you would have to get permits, have to do all these st- right. things. It would get vandalized, all that. Right. Yep. In AR, I just whip, whip it up in like an hour to 30 minutes, go out there, have a joyous, you know, joyous time, have my phone out there, place the model. And um, I'm able to do everything that I want. And I wouldn't have to subject myself to the attention and all the stuff that would come to it. Right. Yeah. And so did that documented, it, just like made it into a course, created the app, put it out there, just put it out there. Right. And, um, and then people kind of, I, I tried to put it out there at the time so that it could sort of raise money and and do all the things and teach people how to do it and introduce this, this novel way of using technology to, uh, to participate in social issues and push the culture forward. Right. Didn't raise a lick of nothing, (laughs) like nothing, like it, it. you know, like five people downloaded it. Ain't nobody, ain't nobody contributed to no funds or anything. Like I was like, damn, this is a complete failure. Oh, right. And so, uh, so I ended up, um, applying for like one of the grants, like everybody else was doing and, uh, ended up getting this grant to work on, um, uh, the next like variation of like Island fear, which is sort of like the Iltopia sort of like storyline, but for like AR. And, um, and so from there, uh, this company called Unity, which is like what people use to like build these experiences out, um, they're pretty much like the Adobe for like game engines, right? And so, um, and so I got on their radar for for the grant as a winner of the grant, and uh, and they're like, oh yeah, let's to like you were mentioned you had did this project, and so that talking about the project, and they sort of featured it on their uh, like Unity for Humanity Summit. And then, uh, and then people started to catch wind of it like mm. months later, right? The yeah. thing has been out for a minute, but uh, it, it's been out since uh, since June. But people were only just now catching wind of it in like September, right? Like <laughs> after everything, after the fight, like everything is done, right? And so um, then from there, like in January, the Wall Street Journal just like reached out to me and just like sent me an email and was like, hey. You know, like there's this opportunity, this thing called the uh, Future for Everything Us uh, conference that we do. It's going to be the first virtual one. And, you know, we'll have Paris Hilton, Gabrielle Union, freaking the guy that started OnlyFans, like all these heavy hitters, (laughs) right? Like just going to be a part of it. And we wanted to know if you would be interested in like, you know, telling your story. And we heard about the George Floyd project and all these different things. And we think you, you would be a good person to like join the crew. And I was like, yeah, like (laughs) what? Yeah. And so, uh, and so, you know, after a couple of conversations and stuff like that, they're like, yeah, we think you would be perfect to, to be a part of it. And, uh, and it it was, it was, it was a pretty, it was a pretty crazy experience. That is awesome. You know, um, uh, yeah, it was just it was just a very interesting experience, you know, like being a part of that and then, you know, typing in my name and then it's like Wall Street Journal, Stephen Christian doing this. And yeah. then, you know, after I finished and like Paris Hilton went on and like did her thing. And before I did that, the Surgeon General was doing his thing. And <laughs> I was just like, dude, like if I don't get a check, if I don't get a blue check after this, like I don't know what else. 
right? And come uh, on, Jake. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a you know I uh, you know it, it's like just that stuff just happens, right? Yep. Like uh, again, I just got another um, got a, another email a little while back of uh, getting invited to speak at the Augmented World Expo, which. For me, I'd be awesome. watching. I'd be watching their videos on YouTube all the time. It's Love like, it. Oh snap! I want to see that, and now I'll be speaking at it. Stuff. So it's like, this is this is my life now. Like, yeah, this is your life. This is how it goes. And this so, is how it uh, goes. And so it, it's a. Uh, I always think back, like, kid you not, like this time last year, I was like, how do I, you know, how do I afford ice cream? And now it's like, how do I, how do I take a vacation? <laughs> yeah, 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 grind it. So. You know, for the folks at home, you know, or younger entrepreneurs, folks kind of following the same footsteps, or even maybe your younger self, what advice would you have? Um, don't listen to people. That that <laughs> first and foremost, people people have no idea what they're talking about, and mm-hmm. uh, and if they knew what they were talking about, then they would be doing different things. Yeah, that, that, that's pretty much how I feel about it. Um, uh, but also listen to people. You know, people will give you very very valuable advice. Um on on what to look out for and what to be aware of because people also have experiences. Mm. And so, um, and so it, it's, you know, it, it, for me, I think the, the valuable thing is that I've always, I'm always talking to new people. Like I, I meet a new person maybe every two days. Nice. And with zoom, it's so much easier to just, it's so much easier to meet people in France and, yep. you know, all these different places. Cause everybody's sort of, yeah, growing well, accustomed like yep. all the Skype commercials that we that we like have seen over the past like 15 20 years are finally a reality. <laughs> They're coming true. And the biggest <laughs> and the biggest people that are benefiting from that is not Skype. <laughs> and so uh and so it, it's a uh, you know for me it, it's um the thing about the pandemic it, it showed that as long as you have a computer an idea and a level of conviction that um, the only thing that, you know, the things that often would get in your way um, are democratized now. Mm-hmm. Now, I would say in like a couple years, it's going to be about the same. But like now things are sort of up in shambles yeah. and institutions are trying to find a way to bring it back to some sort of normalcy, which, you know, sort of perpetuates disparities. Me, I said that I live in, you know, sort of like low income housing and I have skills that can, you know, that people that are sought after, even if I, uh, even if they, even if I haven't been able to tap into the, into those access points now, I have an opportunity now Yeah, because, uh, because people are thinking about other things. Mm. I'm still thinking about those things, but I'm sitting on something right now that I could put out there and sort of fill voids that, that, you know, people, people are just looking to fill. Yeah. And so, uh, and so whether it's animation, whether it's, you know, books or comics for their kids, whether it's online courses, coloring books, um, you know, I was, I, I was really just using what I knew you know, leaning into my strengths and, and trying to fill those voids for other yeah. people. And, uh, and yeah, yeah. You know, just don't put limits on yourself. Like I literally, I make stickers and I go to medical school. You know? <laughs> like it's Right. Like <laughs> that's, that's all, <laughs> you know, and eventually I'll be making uh, stickers. I make stickers for people in medical and school, i'll be a right? doctor yeah, yeah. Well, it's like <laughs> like it, kid you not like i was paying bills off of stickers <laughs> like i make books people don't people don't buy as many books yeah people buy a lot of stickers <laughs> people 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 will buy a book a book's worth of stickers in fact if i buy a book i will probably get a set of stickers sent with the book every time it seems like i get stickers anytime i buy something i get yes. a set of stickers yes <laughs> so. stickers what i found i I started making stickers because people would see the prints and be like, oh, yeah, that's cool. I wish I could put it on my laptop. 
Yeah, that's the big thing. I got a bunch of stickers on my laptop. Yeah. And so from there, I was like, huh, there's something there. And so I would, I used to do like street art. Uh, like when I was in, oh, when I was like living in the Bay Area, right? Like I used to do these like street art things. Mm-hmm. And so uh, pretty much I would just have a tent and I would just have a whole bunch of just like artwork and stuff. I just, I was just killing trees and <laughs> right? And so, uh, and so I, I was like, okay, I got these prints. I got this original art and I have these like stickers here, just whatever. But like, I was just playing around with it. People would always buy the stickers and I wouldn't sell any of the art, right? I would sell like probably a couple original pieces, but like I wouldn't sell any of the prints and stuff. And so I'm thinking like, dang, people are going to buy these prints, you know, I'm, like they're really easy to make and yeah. stuff like that. I'm not thinking about the stickers, but then I started, you know, started just listening to people and seeing the stuff, the responses that people had. And then I sort of just said, okay, well, if people were constantly t- thinking about, okay, I want this sticker design. I want this, I want this, I want this. And I was like, what if I just give it to them? And it, I mean, obviously like it's a lot cheaper to make stickers than prints right. and stuff. So then I just said, okay, how many, let's see how many stickers I could sell. You know, oh, I sold out of these. Let's see if I can make more. Sold out of these. Let me see if I can make more. Before I knew it, I was like, screw the prints. I'm going to just start making stickers. <laughs> yeah. right? And then, uh, and then I, at some point it's like, if you guys buy enough stickers, I'm going to just throw the books in there. You know, and uh, and and people would do that. People would literally come to my table and just clean out all like certain stickers. Wow. And uh, and that that was very informative to me because I went into it to sell books and prints. Mm-hmm. I left selling hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of stickers, and uh, and to the point where it it changed the way that I created, and it, and it changed the way I interacted with customers. And and that interaction with customers um, really allowed me to um, be flexible in my creative process. Mm. And so it's like you you mentioned like, oh, yeah, how do you like come up with ideas and stuff like that? It's like I just listen to people. Yeah. You know, and I just figure like I can there's a lot of stuff that I could do. Yeah. The problem with that is that because I could do a lot of things, it means I could do a lot of things. I like, and I sort of fall victim to the things that everybody else sort of falls victim to. And that's a, that's sort of this, like, you know, just because you could do certain things doesn't Mm -hmm. mean you need to. Yeah. And very, very seldom do I have, do I have an idea that like, I'm just like, I'm going to just do this and do it for, you know, a week and a half. Yeah. You know, I'll come up with an idea and be like, oh yeah, I'll do that. And then 10 minutes later, I have another idea and and it's a completely (laughs) different area. And, and so like things never get done. And so, uh, and so it gave me a level of direction that, um, that I really like started to build on. Nice. So, so for the folks at home that want to follow you either on social media or maybe want to get a sticker, oh, how, yeah. how do they, how do they contact you? How do they get a hold of you? Yeah. So that's a, that's, I'm trying to consolidate, uh, as you know, there's just a lot of, a lot of things, but, um, illtopia.com or shop.illtopia.com shop dot iltopia.com is uh is where like my store is and so if you want to buy stickers you want to buy coloring books books that's where to go um i am doing i would say iltopia so at iltopia on all like the social channels okay and then uh and then my own sort of like personal project uh, pretty much like the the thing that started it all, uh, stuck on an island. It's a S T U C K O N A N E Y E L N D, and pretty much stuck on an island dot com at stuck on an island. Pretty much nice. everything is that right. Like sort of good with the branding, right? Yeah. One name, all you, that's all you got to remember, and that's sort of the catch all for everything. Yeah, right. So if it's like you want to buy stickers, if you want to you know learn courses do AR stuff, just follow like my creative journey, Perfect. follow the medical school journey, just all of that. Um, that's all under stuck on an Island. Nice. And, um, and I, I just, you know, there's so, there's so many platforms that, you know, I sort of just find myself on that, uh, that just sort of having a base that, uh, that allows people to, to access different things. Yeah. TikToks, Instagram, Twitter, Amazon, Yes. Web comics, so many, right? so many mediums. Yeah. Just so many, so many things, right? So like many it, mediums. It's, uh, um, you know, just sort of consolidating that just under one like umbrella, you know, umbrella term or whatever that I have control over that. Nice. That's, uh, you know, that it's, 
it's it's been a journey to get to that point where it's like oh yeah you just go to one link and then yeah. you have everything yeah and it's uh um you know i i'm i'm sort of at that point now nice we'll see how it changes we'll see how it changes yeah. i'm excited to follow. thank you for tuning in to the shades of entrepreneurship for more information please follow the shades of e on twitter instagram facebook or visit the shades of e.com